This is my impression of a soloed 1970s jingle bass part. <laughs> oh wait, click track. Oh, thank you so much. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. family? Not really. I found out that I did have a grandfather that was a cantor, but, and my older brother played the clarinet, and uh, I ended up getting the clarinet. It was sort of handed down to me, but my clarinet expertise was uh, dicey at best. I took piano lessons like every other kid, didn't really care about it too much. I wish I cared about it more now because I would have been way better as a musician at this point in my life, but I used to hate practicing so much that I would tape myself practicing and play it so that my mother would think I was practicing. <laughs> oh my now, now you're on the bandstand at what, 14? You, you, you're enamored with Hendrix and Clapton? Okay, it, it goes a little bit further back than okay. that. I started, um, I, I, the neighbors across the street for us, from us in Bethesda, Maryland, which is right outside of DC, right. had a drum set and I sat down and for some reason I found that I was able to actually play something after not really sitting for too long. I mean, I was able to play a beat after a long, not that long, and I liked it a whole lot more than the clarinet. And I liked it a whole lot more than the piano and it was fun. And so my first real appearance on the bandstand, believe it or not, was at a drummer in summer camp. I think I was 11 or 12, and then I started getting into guitar because I got a guitar for my bar mitzvah. As a matter of fact, I got it from my uncle who was in the catalog business, and the, he had this like Telstar guitar, of which I still have the neck, by the way, and um, started teaching myself how to play guitar when I was uh, up at school. I, w I went to a school where there was a dormitory, and on the weekends, my old friend Michael Gurry lent me this SG Special, which by now is like got a huge price tag on it, you know what I mean? And I started teaching myself guitar and, and actually developed some expertise at it, enough to the point where I really was like a Hendrix and Clapton guy when I was like 13 and 14. Wow, so tell me about your first gig. Are we talking about high school gigs or yeah, real gigs? Yeah, very first one. Wow, first one was probably... As a guitar a, player? Prob yeah, probably a school dance. You know, at school and various school dances after that. Did, was that at the point where you decided, hey, I want to do this for the rest of my life? No. The, t okay. the time, I mean, I wanted to be a rock and roll star back then. <laughs> but what I really knew I was going to do it for the rest of my life was when I went to my cousin Merrill's wedding and I sat in with the club date band. And they said, you know, go home and get, oh, you're a guitar player? Go home and get your guitar. So I did and I came back and the uh, guy who broke me into the business, my mentor, Bob Weiner, fine pianist, said, you know, to the band leader, this kid is good, let's use him. Well, your goal, you, you say your goal was to, oh, to be a first call guy. Well, what, what the thing about the bass that was really interesting to me is it took a lot of the responsibility of me having to be in the front. Tell me about some of the artists you work with. Because I know you mentioned John Lee Hooker, you mentioned... Uh... John Lee Hooker session was, we were, when I was playing with Johnny Winter, which was in the, uh, which was 89 to 95, mm -hmm. Uh, John Lee Hooker was recording an album called Mr. Lucky. Okay. And they brought all different bands in to guest on these, you know, all the bands. Like Santana brought his band in, Van Morrison brought his band in. It was produced by a really fine slide guitar player, no relation, Roy Rogers mm -hmm. from the Bay Area. Really tremendous musician. And he produced this record. And I had met him through the Johnny Winter and Roy Buchanan days. I played with Roy before Johnny, and that's how I got the gig because when. Uh, the esteemed John Paris left Johnny Winter, they said, uh, well, what are we going to do? And Johnny said, well, get that guy to play with Roy Buchanan. So I kind of, you know, was ushered in there pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. 
And what do you learn from working with the masters? I mean, when you're with Johnny Winter, you're you're on the world stage. Well, exactly. And one of the things I learned from them was something I had learned playing in Broadway pit orchestras, that it's not your name on the ticket and your job is to make these people sound as good as they can possibly sound. Or what I like to, when people say, well, what do you really like to do? And I, my one sentence summation of that is, I want to be one of the very best at running behind the elephant with the pail. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, I really love getting people out of trouble on stage and fixing things before people even know they're broken. Ah, now this is one of the, <clears throat> tell me one time you saved the whole band from going off the train, going off the rail, because that's what bass players do. Um, well, knowing the songs, for one thing. In other words, if I'm in, if I'm in a situation, uh, like if I'm doing a concert, I can't remember exactly what, but it has happened. Well, Rita Moreno, for instance, when I played with her for many, many years, I was her, ba her bass player, and talk about learning from somebody who's one of the best at what they do. And, you know, a lot of the guys and a lot of the bands were, um, they all had arrangements. I mean, you know, we had world-class orchestrations by people like John Rodby, cousin of Steve Rodby, by the way, the great bass player, um, Harry Betts, I mean, all film composers. I mean, Rita was in L.A. at the time. And what we would have to do is we would have to, like, fake things sometimes without charts. Like Rita says, well, let's sing Sunny Side of the Street. And we were somewhere where we were at some event in residence, and that's what you do. You know, it's like, oh, Sunday Side of the Street, I know that. I played that in Oakland Jewish Center in 1974. Oh, you want to do it in B-flat? Oh, no problem. I learned how to do that because of having to transpose things in any key on a club date without the music. I mean, and that was the skill at the time. If you had a big band of like 20 musicians at that time, there were never charts. So they had these guys that could play third and fourth trumpet ports, parts and, you know, second and third saxophone parts without the music. And it sounded like they were reading and it sounded like it was rehearsed. It was unbelievable skill. And so that's one of the most important things I ever learned how to do. And then reading came after that because reading came more simply to that being in the Catskills because, oh, I know... Um, you know, rock by your baby. I played it at blah, 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 country club, you know? And oh, that's what those squiggly things look like. They're the notes to the bass line of rock by your baby, you know? And, I, and it just kind of came together with it, you know, like, um, you know, absorption and, absorption and regurgitation, like what studying is, I guess, yeah. you know? What, what about, tell us, how did you break into the Broadway scene? It's very difficult. Okay, uh, the Broadway scene came from some old friends of mine that we're all getting the gig at Radio City Music Hall at the same time. Radio City had just been bought by a new uh, company. I think it was Filmways owned it or something. And they were changing the whole paradigm of the shows. They brought in Tom Baylor, the great uh, composer who, and studio singer in L.A., best known for his work with Quincy Jones and uh, all kinds of people like that. I mean, Thriller, I mean, he's on, his presence with Quincy is huge. So they brought him in to write all the music. And the uh, orchestra contractor was a, um, oh, oh, the guy who the, who the guy was the overall credit um, was, um, musical guy was a guy named Robert Yanni. And the, the percussionist, Bob Swan, was the contractor of the orchestra. And my friends, Robbie Kershoff, and a bunch of other people got in there as like the first band, Mario DeCutis, who's best known for alto mode, I mean, for drum cat, fine drummer, fine percussionist. Robbie's a fine guitar player. And they were all getting the gig at Radio City in 1979 in time for a show called, a production show they did called A New York Summer. Mm. So um, I was brought in to sub and eventually replace Marty Balk, who was the electric bass player there. They had three bass players, one electric bass player and two upright bass players in the orchestra. So after that, um, I started subbing on shows because I would meet a lot of the musicians that were involved in this. And the first show I ever subbed on was a Cy Coleman musical called Barnum. Okay. That the contractor was uh, a name you probably know now, a great bass player named John Miller. And that's where he got his start contracting Broadway shows and records and movies and everything else that he does. So I was a sub there. And the drummer was a guy named John Redsecker. Mm -hmm. who's played with Peter Allen, and he's played with this one, and he's played with that one. He's the drummer at Aladdin currently. So across the street from the St. James was a theater called the Broadhurst. And at the Broadhurst was a very revolutionary show at the time called Dancing. Mm -hmm. And he takes me across the street and, he, and introduces me, who was standing on the sidewalk outside the theater, to Alan Herman, 
the drummer, who is, um, he was the second drummer in Ten Wheel Drive, the rock band, after Luther Ricks okay. and before Barry Lazarowitz. He was also in the band Randall's Island with Elliot Randall, mm. and that band became the rhythm section for Jesus Christ Superstar on Broadway. Mm. So there was a lot of new stuff starting to happen at that time. So what through that- What does it that, take to be a Broadway player? Um, preparation. Yeah. Preparation in terms of, it doesn't matter how great you sight read, because that's what happened to me at Barnum. I went in there going, yeah, I could sight read this, and I made a couple of stupid mistakes that if I would have done more homework, I wouldn't have made the mistakes. So what it takes on Broadway in terms of personality is that they don't even want to know that the regular guy is there. If they feel that nothing is wrong and nothing is missing, you know, the, the highest praise you get is, yeah, it was fine. And that's what my friend John Montagna calls a gig victory. <laughs> what, were some of the fa what were some of your favorite shows to work on? To sub or to play? Uh, yeah. I mean, for various reasons, because I know we're going to get into some, well, you wanted to get into some challenge. controversial dancing. Okay. Dancing. And I hope I don't sound too conceited here, but Please. there was some very, very rough bass stuff that was um, just bass and hi-hat with the stage and all this Bob Fosse choreography. And after these two particular tunes, they actually did Big Noise from Winnetka as part of that, where the percussionist, who was Rogelio Tehran at the time, would come over and do the drumsticks on the bass strings thing, just like the original. And I'm really proud to say, and it was probably one of my greatest gig moments, I got applause from the orchestra. Okay, so that's your gig, that is, that is the That's a watershed moment for okay. me, for sure. Thank you for watching part one of Tom's interview with Jeff Gans. Be sure to tune in for part two next time, here on Know Your Bass Player. See you then.